I'd like to acknowledge Australia's First Nation people as the traditional custodians of the land, and for this episode in particular, the Wiradjuri Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I mean, most of my third 25 years in Mudgee has been as equally success and failures. And you're pretty much anyone you talk to is organics has said there is no textbook, there is no right or wrong way to do it. You just have to experience it. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. David Lowe, or Lowy, is about as legendary as you get in the Australian wine world. Winemakers idolise him, wine drinkers covet his bottles. And he has his hand in the progress and development of the greater wine industry and has done for years. Proprietor and winemaker at Lowe Family Wine Co. in Mudgee, he joins us today to set me on the straight and narrow. Hi, David. Thanks for joining me. No problem, Shannon. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I've been dying to have you on and so have my colleagues at Deep in the Weeds and we finally knuckled you down so that we can chat to you. Now, I believe you got the wine bug at a very young age. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it turned out that when I was at the school, I was at an agricultural school, the careers advisor told us that when we took our electives when we were 15, that we needed to be sure of our occupation. So I had worked in a winery next door called Craigmore in the laboratory. I quite liked chemistry and I would live next door. So I worked there every school holidays. And when it came to choose my electives, I chose those that, uh, those that were related to winemaking studies at Rosewood College. So I took the electives and decided I was going to be a winemaker. So from 15, I've always said that's my career. Um, Incredibly, when we had our reunion 10 years ago, of the 50 students, 35 of us had made the same decision to be a certain occupation, not winemakers, but they've stuck to their occupation when they were 15. That's just crazy because I remember even at my school, they told you, you know, that we needed to have some kind of purpose and that we needed to know what we're doing. And all of us kind of floundered around going, I haven't even thought about it. I haven't got a clue. We contrast that with my son who's 32 and he's only just worked out he wants to be a winemaker as well. So it's after a you 17-year know, gap. So that's just the way it is. And, and, and we, were, we didn't have much choice, but we stuck to our jobs. That was a, how we thought of things, a job for life pretty much. Wow. Well, I'm, I love that commitment, but also, I mean, I think, yeah, things have changed a lot in that time. And I'm thrilled to hear that, uh, that your son has come round to seeing the, the light. Yes, he, he uh, early on he'd been exposed to wine. He was, there's photos of him putting his hand in vats and helping out from time to time. And then he went to uh, he's making wine in Tasmania, Pinot Noir, and he just had a trip to Germany making wine himself for his own brand. And he's um, you know he's very happy to come and be part of our innovation. He he sees like I do that the world we live in, the way we drink wine now is going to change in the next 30 years and he wants to be part of it. It's, it's been highly motivating. Yeah, that's so great to hear. I'm thrilled to hear it. Now, tell me a little bit about what was your parents' reaction when you decided that, yeah, you're going to be a winemaker, you've decided on that. Were they thrilled? No, I think my I think the story came from other people. They would never talk to me about it, but I, my father's view of a winemaker was someone who shared it in a brown bag under a bridge. That was pretty much what a wine drinker did in those times. My mother probably went straight to church to pray for my soul, but they were beer drinkers or whiskey drinkers. Um, they had no idea that the wine industry was such an engaging industry. Later on, uh, my father developed a wine cellar and he was became a collector of wine. Or I shouldn't say collector, he probably drank most of the wine I collected, but he did like good wine. And he had changed him a lot. He realised that it wasn't such a bad profession, particularly in my case when, when well, fortune, my timing was fortunate because every student, every graduate arose with him, there was about 16 in my year. We all had three jobs to go to. So it was a pretty go-ahead industry at that time. Wow, that's fantastic. Tell me about the Roseworthy College days because I'm always fascinated fascinated to hear what, you know, scoundrel acts you got up to and and who was part of your um your kind of collegiate class. Yeah, so when there was five of us, five of us shared a room, a shared a house, I said not a room. We shared a house a uh, 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 a winemaker called Nigel Dolan, a, a male friend of mine, Mike DeGarris, Peter Scholes, Tom Newton. We had um, Joe Grilly in our class and Andrew Garris and we had Dave Morris and Andy Buller. So we had a stretch of winemakers from right around Australia. We're all Ros Ritchie from Mansfield in uh, 
and, and Delatite. So there was a whole lot of us who were all new to the game, real, real, uh, real, really green at our job. And then we, but we were mostly influenced by viticulture. I think the two great viticulturists taught us to be grape growers first were Richard Smart and Peter Dry. So they were our they're our leaders, if you like, and they were really enthusiastic about us as students. They hated winemakers, but <laughs> so, as viticulturists, that started the whole progression. And we was really blue sky. We were close to the Barossa Valley. We we drank and lived wine. The college was an interesting collection of farmers, horse industry people. They even had a scheme where they had arid farmers from Saudi Arabia on a scholarship that were there that were Muslim and living in the same college. Uh, it was an eclectic group of people all either studying arid farming or winemaking or, or horse or, or um, natural resource management. So it was a big place. It doesn't exist anymore. It's been the wine faculties moved to Adelaide University. But it was pretty much where you had to go to learn about wine. You lived and breathed wine. So if you made a bad career choice, it was pretty obvious within about three months. And there was a few that started and didn't complete it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah, all or nothing. Uh, it's amazing to hear about, you know, who were your other kind of students and, and co- colleagues in the day because it's always fascinating to kind of picture, you know, your the class of and, and where they are now, which is, you know, amazing uh, individuals that have kind of set up the Australian wine industry. But after after Roseworthy, you, you were part of the kind of flying winemakers or Brat Pack, as it's explained. Tell me a little bit about that and how it got how it got its name. Yeah, so we were, I'd, I'd been previously at a winemaker in the Hunter Valley. I worked for Len Evans for 12 years as a winemaker in the Hunter Valley. And then I, um, we had a whole lot of European winemakers who would join us from time to time. They were relatives of famous wine people that Len had known or Murray Tyrrell had known. And one of them was a winemaker called Hugh Ryman, who was uh, sort of English Raj, but then he'd settled in Bergerac in Bordeaux. And he was looking for a group of winemakers to go into into Bordeaux or France mostly, but in other countries later on to to make wine for the English supermarkets. That was our our main objective, and it was a real baptism of fire. We were moved from the comfort of technology and language into a, into other parts of Europe, and we were subjected to really different environments. Um, not only technically and production-wise, but also living in the villages about it. And it was uh, one of the most incredible experiences I had um, for all sorts of reasons. I did it for five years. It was on and off. You'd fly in and out regularly um, to be be involved with the winemaking, selection of grapes, package, make the wine, package the wine, and then you never saw it again. So it was basically sent over to the UK and sold in the supermarkets under various labels and ranges of wines, but it was pretty much seen as uh, Australianisation or some New Zealanders as well to bring a technical competence to these wines that were strongly regionally focused but were pretty much close to being faulty and, and, and average in quality. So our job was to to lift the quality and keep the price pretty keen. And we ran into some animosity with some of the better known Appalachian examples, uh, but we were really, really loved by the villages we lived in because we gave them a chance to, for commercial reasons, to make these mainly cooperatives more successful and uh, gave the growers much more money. So it was a really inspiring process. It was, you're really on your own. You're, you're really for putting out putting out fires, as they would say, um, but we we made all of us made a change and there would have been about 16 of us I think at the time wow that's amazing and, and I can't imagine yeah you know that fine line of kind of having to tell people that they you know shouldn't do this or do that because of microbial issues whatever but then there must have been some give back as well you know with in terms of the the techniques that they were using did you pick up a little bit that you wanted to take with you along the way Yes, I, and we really had little help. We were given the we were given a car, a, a jet, a place to live, and then they, and the name and addresses of the winery, and we just were on our own to go and sort out how we would make these batches of wine. And and the I mean the negative was that we had you know I had a real disdain for the way the Appalachian system had treated some of these sub regions uh, because it was you know there was them and us 
but I really loved the regionalism part of it. And I think that's something that was never tangible. I think James Halliday asked me once, you know, what was the big difference? And I said, oh, I just got to understand the region and nothing clear what I did. We just really used a scrubbing brush and cleaned the place up. But we learned a lot about respect in a region, the, the f- fact that all these regions were autonomous. Uh, they all lived and breathed by um, their their appellation, which I got to be highly critical of later on. But it was uh, to being uprooted and moved in somewhere where you're uncomfortable really makes you work quite a bit harder. And you're obser- you, I was very observant of how they grew grapes, how they classified grape quality and then how they turned it into wine. And and you learn to respect history much more than you would in Australia. There, there was no barrier to change in technology. You could do anything you like in Australia for making wine in those days, as long as you didn't poison the people. Over there, you had to respect local, local um, social mores and, and, and appellation systems, which uh, c- can be claustrophobic at times. And as I said, I was critical of it in the end, how, how it was held them back in many ways. Mm. And I suppose as well in terms of, yeah, creative freedom and, and you know, uh, topography laws, you know, there could be somebody just on the outskirts that's doing everything right, but because they didn't fall into a category, they, they therefore had no kind of um, commercial opportunities to put wine into that particular appellation, which can be, it can be quite brutal, can't it? It can. And as a, I made better wine in Australia for being over there. That's no doubt about that. I think most people would agree with that. Yeah, incredible. It's such a um a amazing part of history and and yeah, like you said, you're you're better for it and no doubt they have you ever come across a bottle of those wines that you like that you have ever seen again down the line? Yeah, I bought a bottle at a it was a called La Lazidiere or Lazadiere. It was a Bordeaux Superior Blanc. It was bottled in nineteen ninety three and I bought it at an auction. Oh, it would have been one of the lock auction houses about 15 years later, and it was awful. <laughs> it was awful. I wanted it to be really good, <laughs> but it was awful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love your honesty. That's great. So tell me a little bit about, you know, when you went back to, to Mudgee and planting the first vineyard. Yeah, so I planted the vineyard in – my father and I planted the vineyard in 74. We planted Chardonnay – I think we stole them from the neighbour. We had at that stage it was about a twenty-acre vineyard. It was quite large, all Chardonnay, come from the experience at Craigmore. We uh, we, le- we it was leased to another winemaker for twenty years, and then it was to revert back to me after twenty years because my father realised then that I was in the wine business. He wanted to diversify. He'd like all those farmers up here, they were prone to, they had no control over market. They would sell cattle and sheep at whatever the market gave them or crops. So he was looking at some other diversified industry and we were in a, we had a great spot uh, in, in relation to other vineyards in the area, which were starting to expand. So I, I got involved with this vineyard as an, at an early age of about 14 or 15. And it was done pretty badly, as, as we would, because we did on a shoestring without any real knowledge. And then I took the vineyard over in 94. I thought I was going to get it, but I was had to buy it from my parents. And then I realised pretty much that it had been run down and pretty bad. So I, I eventually I pulled it out in 2007. But at the time from mid-90s when I was in, in backwards and forwards from France and I was in and out of the Hunter Valley waiting for, I guess, the tap on the shoulder to come and run the farm in Mudgee, which never happened, I had to sort of take it over in the end. I planted a vineyard. My my wife and I planted a vineyard, um, all all based on really uh, very old world techniques. So we planted the vines without irrigation. We planted them without trellising. They're all what we call bush vines, heavily influenced by Sonoma in California, and particularly some of the varieties that they were growing there really well. Uh, and we decided that we'd make them organically, which meant that we had to do it without irrigation was a, was a bit problematic with with organics at the time. So we took on a really different way of growing grapes from based on our experience traveling in Europe and also in, in the United States. And they're all reds because uh, that stage Mudgee was 70% red wine. It was known was everybody was chasing the red wine because it was color, tannin and concentration. So it was it went a long way in a blend. So most of the major wine companies had a holding in Mudgee that they used variously to um, improve their other red wines. So I just 
thought that we had a, we had a lot of land here. It was a thousand acres, and I had a lot of land with different soil types and and different aspects, which I picked up from being in Europe. So we had a great time, sort of playing in a on the, our blocks of land here in Mudgee, and did some we thought some innovative viticulture, and we built a winery in two thousand about 10 times bigger than I really needed and now it's of course it's now too small but that's that's <laughs> in hindsight so I, I worked through the whole thing with the wine industry from in Mudgee from 1995 till now I, I, I call it the I call it sort of the accordion part of the wine industry it was in and out in and out in and out I think I've seen four or five expansions and retraction contractions of the wine industry and a lot of that was when I was here in Mudgee. Yeah, it's it's been fascinating, isn't it? And and Mudgee for me uh, was really instrumental in when I started drinking wine, and and it was a what a lot of my family and family friends, teachers, they often had a lot of Mudgee wine in their cellar. But from family owned estates like Craigmore and Huntington, and and places that before there was a bit more of a boom for people going in and and purchasing and things like that and so it has a special place in my heart but there's certainly been a lot of change that's happened take me back to like 2000 what was the kind of response when you kind of built the winery and and you started making wines what was your response from your peers like oh they all thought that um mudgy really was uh, is in no man's land it didn't it wasn't um, wasn't really seen as a business move it was uh, sort of moving back to the family farm people thought i was a sort of a retirement mode which i was which wasn't fair because i was quite young at the time uh people had heard of it but people didn't visit it um yet it had its own little little um ecosystem of winemakers and grape growers and at that stage, it was riding the boom of the expansion of the Australian wine industry. So it, it had gone from 600 hectares to 3,000 hectares of vineyard. And uh, and it's now contracted to about 1,700 hectares. I remind people that's about the size of Sancerre at the moment. So it's not insignificant, but it's quite small by Australian standards. So, you know, I think they thought it was a bit of a joke moving to Mudgee. And I planted some varieties that, that uh, everyone else was a bit silly, but I was trying to match climate to, to climate and wine style to what the region could do early on. What I did was underestimate how long it would take to get things back to balance. That's one of the reasons that we went into organics and biodynamics. We had a, a very broken farm. It was a shadow of itself now. It was pretty much completely ruined the farm by lack of attention and um, someone loving it. My parents were loving it, but they were old and, and they were ineffective in the farm. It's not their fault, but there was no succession planning. There was no real business plan about and farming plan. So we've set about since 2000 to try and fix the farm at the same time, which is, although it's by Australian standards are small, it's quite large for the area. And there was it, it was a beautiful spot, but it needed some help. So the, the really the engine room of the business was coming from making wine. I made a lot of wine under contract initially because I had a large winery that was, was unused. I had vineyards that were just gro- were growing and expanding. I had no real name in the wine industry except for working for other companies. I'd been overseas for five years. Uh, there was very little New South Wales branded wine that was of any note that, that was popular. Uh, yeah, those, they started to see restaurants were looking for diverse ranges of wines, but Mudgee was probably bypassed because there wasn't any real advocates. You think about a place like Mudgee and a place like the Hunter Valley. They had Hunter Valley had really powerful advocates: Max Lake, Brian Morgan, Len Evans, Murray Tyrrell, the Tullock family. They were all very much instrumental in driving popularity of uh, Hunter Valley. So Mudgee had really had really only had Bob Roberts pretty much at the time from Huntington Estate who was an advocate. So it didn't really sit well with the indig- normal wine industry. So we're on our own as being individual operators and that's why, as you say, they're all family wine companies who were there for maybe lifestyle reasons. Yeah, incredible incredible for you to kind of um, have been in that place for so long and, and uh, have seen the ebbs and flows. In terms of uh, 
taking over and looking into kind of now being certified and biodynamic. Tell me a little bit about just how you saw that change. I mean, you obviously saw that something needed to be done to restore some of those, um, the land and the soils, but tell me a little bit about the process of getting certified and changing to biodynamics and how you saw the changes happen. Yeah, this is uh, this is where I, I mean, most of my third 25 years in Mudgee has been as e- equally success and failures and you pretty much anyone you talk to who's organics has said there is no textbook, there is no right or wrong way to do it. You just have to experience it. And I didn't get much help really. I think I was a uh, my old lecturer, David Brewer, gave me some help initially when not from Langhorn Creek when I said announced I wanted to be organic. But pretty much what uh, we decided to do was to go organic by going cold turkey. So we'd We'd been ha- an agricultural system of killing weeds and putting fertiliser on. We decided to remove. We sold all the stock on the farm and we shut the farm down to heal the native grasses and restore some sort of balance to the system by no, not interfering. We left it alone for three or four years. And the, so the mistake I made, or we made, or my wife, um, for our ex-wife, sadly, sadly, but my ex-wife and I, we'd set up this process was that we'd let the land heal, but we decided to remove all influences. So this cold turkey approach meant that there was no ecosystem and to be organic, you need an ecosystem because you can't kill things in organics. You've got to work with things and let things happen and you need a, a habitat to form. So there was 10 or 15 years probably where we found that systems were out of balance and you needed to restore health. And if you tried to fix the farm to where the state it was in to where you wanted it, it would have been many, many millions of dollars and involvement of a lot of money and chemicals and rehabilitation. We didn't have that, so we left it alone naturally. The, the mistake we made originally was that we went organic first and biodynamic second. We should have probably been biodynamic first and organic second. And, and for the listener, really, biodynamics tells you what you have to do and biodynamics tells you what you can't do. So organics really tells you to be organic, you have to restrict things that your inputs that you do, they have to be certified organic, they have to be naturally occurring or made on the farm. To be biodynamic means it's a recipe to actually improve soil health and uh, the ecosystem of agriculture, particularly horticulture. So we did it the wrong way around. So, you know, it was very slow to heal and when we really took on biodynamics in 2011, but more importantly, the last five years, we've seen a huge jump in productivity and, and biodiversity. And so we, we probably wasted 10 or 15 years by just waiting for things to improve. Now, that's fine, except that you have the radical nature of agriculture with flooding rains and extreme droughts and temperature changes. So all of that means that although you're... you're optimistic about getting a result, it, things get in the way, <laughs> um, which it is, and I'm being honest about that, but we've, we haven't made our best wine, we had a, a broken system, and now we're, we're really seeing things starting to work now, but it, you can't ask a bank to have be patient for 20 years while you work through the system. It's still a structural problem with how do we make organics and biodynamics popular, how do we educate people, how do we advocate for it, and how do we provide a business case for it? And I'm still wrestling with that and working hard behind the scenes or trying to work hard behind the scenes to better represent what it's what it really means and what it stands for. Yeah, I mean, it, it's no easy task in terms of the fact that, you know, there are going to be many challenging years ahead and uh, it, there are sacrifices that you have to make in terms of, you know, what you're allowed to do or not do. And at times uh, that can be detrimental to you guys in terms of what you put into bottle. But you've been, you know, incredibly proactive in looking at, uh, you know, new clones and new varieties that you think will do well in the area. Talk me through a little bit about the kind of biological range and the kind of Latin quarter in what you're planting there. Well, I'm most excited I've ever been in the wine industry as of now. So I think I'm as optimistic as I'll ever be and as positive about it as I'll ever be now. And that is, I think, finally trying to link regionalism with what grows best. And that's come over from by being in and out of Europe for a while and watching precedents, but more likely having the data. And where we've been going wrong for the last 180 years is we've supplanted and put in 
the French varieties, and we've mod we've tried to make them in their image. And of course, Cabernet is really good in Bordeaux, but it may not be good in Mudgee. It might be work great in Margaret River. So we've started to realize I've started to realize that what we've done in the past may not be the right thing now. And then you add climate change into it, where we all know, all farmers know it. You can forget about the deniers. Most good farmers will have realised in the last 20 years the, the ground, the ground, the grasses that grow, the crops they grow have all changed the way they operate. And you'd be a good farmer will have already made those calculations and starting to look forward. So in, in my turn, I looked at what the, the Climate Atlas has done, which is that marvellous wine Australia process, which all the wine regions have got a climate index till the year 2100. I started to look at where we need to be in the next 30 to 40 years with the projections. I started to look at our needs, which was to make wines that were less, there's less intervention, need less sprays, more disease resistant, can handle salt, they can handle tough weather, tough skins, they have different flavours. And I started to settle on these southern Italian varieties, mostly white wines, which are really different to taste. And I've been doing it the last my first range is out now, and I've added to that I've got the what I call the biological range, which is the preservative free range, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I'm most excited about these Italian whites for, because they have this what they call briny or salt taste to them, even though it's not it's not like table salt, but they have a really different texture about them. And I got in I get into all sorts of arguments with conventional wine people, but you can actually throw an ice cube in these things and they taste the same. You can't do that with Cabernet. You can't do that with Semillon or Riesling because they just look thin. But these white wines have got an amazing texture. They drop the alcohol. They smell and taste the same pretty much. And you can enjoy them for a longer period of wine with the diet that I think we're going to have to do and, and be used. The young people love it. They love the story. They love the flavour. They like the taste. They're exotic in nature. They're not, not crazy different like Sauvignon Blanc is versus, a, say, a Chardonnay. But the taste and flavours are really interesting and they grow really well. They're easy to grow and they don't need intervention. You don't have to do a lot of work on them. So I'm really, really, really impressed the way they grow and, and way I'm so excited about what we can do with it. The market wants it. They, they, uh, they're very different from most other varieties, but that's nothing wrong with that. And they, I think they're suited to where we're going in climate, certainly in my region, and I think there are probably a lot of other regions in Australia. It's worth looking at. The... Biological range is something that I've been working on since 2009. I have, I'm mildly asthmatic. I have some particular resistance. I don't like sulfur and sulfur affects me. I'm not, obviously, I'm not acute. I'm, I'm sensitive to it. So I had a conversation with uh, a customer once in 2009. I said, why don't you make sulfur-free wine? And I thought, why not? So I did a lot of research on it, uh, going right back to chemistry. And uh, I really loved this project. It took me six or nine months to get it right. So I make these preservative-free wines. I did did red wines for for about uh, twelve years. Then I started doing rosés, and now I do white wine, preservative wine, and they are the hardest thing I've ever done in winemaking. Really, really difficult to make well. Wine is halfway between grape juice and vinegar. Without sulphur, it's very, very difficult to stop the process going to completion. And you need pure technology and um, good equipment and great understanding of chemistry and microbiology, but it's everything that I ever learnt and winemakers should should practice doing more and more of it. I really I like what happens with the wine. It's it's difficult to sell re, uh, difficult to sell on wholesale because a lot of if you if you give it to a restaurant to serve, they might not they might open it and two days later still pour it and it's oxidized then no good. But as a wine to have over a day or so, it's a really, really interesting taste and flavour in wine without sulphur, particularly. Yeah, I think it's. Um, I mean, fascinating. I think I, I love where you're going down some of the the Italian wine varietal route, and I love that you talked a little bit about kind of salinity because. I have always been somebody that's a bit of an acid junkie and quite likes salt. I know that salt can be bad for me, but it's such an interesting um, flavor profile when you look at kind of things like I really like um, Assertico and I like um, Sherry and like Manzanillas and and I like Chablis. And there was always this um, underlying kind of salty, briny 
vibe that you would get from some of these wines. And I think um, in particular in your Ansonica, you really see it and it just adds this other dimension to the wine. And I don't know if it's, I mean, do you know where that kind of comes from? I've heard all different things, but I, I mo- mostly have heard that that kind of salinity comes from the grape, but also the yeast and the pH and the acidity into play. But there's a lot of people that say it can come from the environment that where it's grown or what's your take on that? Yeah, I think it's it's mostly to do with the environment, with the, not just latitude, but sort of the the solar radiation and UV effect on skin. So the skins are really different; are a different beast. Uh, when you wine make it, you uh, you end up with a slightly higher pH because of the way you process it. But I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that there's a there's a, a huge amount of sunlight on the berries, and they're quite golden in colour, and that seems to be uh, Mediterranean in nature. And in winemaking, you you might in in Australia you might correct that, but in in, in Italy uh, and probably in Greece, you it's it's the indelible stamp of the wine, and you applaud it, and you look for it. And and I've we've had to change a bit of our winemaking process to make to in, to to not remove that character from the wine by excessive adjustment and manipulation, and they just turn out different all the way along the line, and they're quite tasty they've the colors are stronger than normal uh, if uh, but that's that, that's okay they're not they're not oxidized colors necessarily they're skin colors and skin flavors and they've picked up some of the potassium that's come from the skin I think and that's inherently helping some of the flavor taste towards that salty mm. spectrum incredible I mean I just I love how much you have going on and and um, then you also have you know your kind of iconic series where they're wines that you know I tasted when I was younger that are, that are still incredibly present if you were to kind of put mudgy wines in a uh, Australian sense what do you think mudgy kind of offers as a region that is unlike any of the other regions in Australia. Yeah, so the, there was – I did this years ago and I took 12 wines from producers and I had a really – an old friend who's a very good taster uh, and we sat down and we drank 12 wines in, in, in covered in bags and we tried to find the common thread and, uh, and we sort of settled on three things. One is there was a – there is a middle palate – a middle palate acidity, but yet an alcoholic texture to wines, which is um, it's sort of umami based without being sweet, of course, as you know. But the middle palate acidity means the wines of high alcohol don't appear porty or jammy necessarily. The mm-hmm. wines have tannin and concentration and long, long ability to age. You see them sometimes in wines of Heathcote um, somewhere along the line. So, and it's no accident that they're both – we share – Gold mining history and quartz and shale is our primary geological source for grapes. So we we see these wines as having um, texture, concentration, a um, fair bit of tannin and acidity, so they're quite slow to age and evolve. If you're looking for a European equivalent, it's probably somewhere like Cahor, C-A-H-O-R, where they're four or five mm. years of age before they come together. So a lot of us, mm. it's a bit old-fashioned, a bit hard to tell, but, to tell people, but... They are okay after four or five years. They sort of you contain those tannins, so that's what that's with it. But but I'm talking about the traditional European or French varieties. There's way more mm-hmm. interest in some of these new Italian varieties where they can be more brighter and lighter and softer and fleshier as a as a youthful age. And so I think it's time that we used our understanding of climate change and and our understanding of where the market goes, and and retire these wines in my view, and start thinking about wines that are actually way more suited to where people want to drink and what they want to make and what we can grow rather than having to interfere. Mm-hmm. So one part of what I've just described is how we've dealt in the past, my 45 years in winemaking. The best bit mm-hmm. is what we can do in the future. For the first time, we have a chance to get things right that are not just come from tradition, they've come from design and, and knowledge and research. And that's exactly where the industry needs to move, I think. And it's very positive if you start doing that. Kids these days, they they research. They'll get up and they'll find out. They'll find if it's true or not. They'll find the way to do it. We would just go and do what Mm. someone else told us to do. And I think that's where Mm. it's positive for people in regions like us. And a lot of us, it's not just us, it's 61 other regions. So we will all say that we haven't made our best Mm. wine yet. I love that. I think um, it's so interesting that that you say – that because you also 
have already said just how important it is to to have an understanding of history and what it means. But the beauty of the wine industry is that, you know, you're going to be able to go to Mudgee and you're going to be able to see a lineage of and a history of what Mudgee has done well. And of course, wineries that continue to go down that traditional route. And you're also going to have wineries that are only looking forward and and creating, you know, new things and, and seeing what's going to, you know, make the land better for the generations to come. And that's what I love about visiting a region is that you, you can kind of get a snapshot of past, present and future all at the same time by visiting different wineries and seeing what they offer. Yeah, I, I, I frequently go to places and say, what's new? What can you show me that's new? Because I sort of understand on what's in the past and, and I admire and I love the fact that we hold on tradition and we learn from it. That's absolutely important. But what's new is great. And, and young people want to know what's new too. And they're the future yeah. of winemaking and consumption. Yeah, very well said. I want to talk a little bit about Zin House because um, it's remarkable. But I also want to know a little bit about you talked about Len Evans earlier and you worked closely with him. Len Evans was a big foodie as well, loved his cooking. But what did Len Evans, if you had to pick one thing that you think kind of stayed with you that he taught you, what what would it be? Well, firstly, he had a complete disregard for any business case in anything he did. It was really about having a great time, pursuit of quality and getting rid of compromise. Um, uh, people argue that it's probably, you know, been the, my downfall that <laughs> I think it, you go for quality and you go for the things that are really interesting and good and having a great time. And that was my early, from, you know, from, tw- from 20 till 32, he was, it was a huge influence on my, on my life. Uh I think what he taught me most of all was that you need a memory. You use wine as a great memory. So uh, where, where is a dog can hit a wall when it gets a smell? He was always remembering a certain wine he tried and where it was. And he used that all the time with, with great effect to tell you, well, I've tried this wine here and that. He memorised the wine by its taste. And it used to transform to different places. He'd bring up great stories, a great storyteller. Uh, and he... He loved food. He loved cooking with food. He didn't. He didn't like two things too ornate. Although he supported a lot of ornate things, we had such fun playing with food and wine. Although I was, I'm not a very good cook, and uh, I was way in the background of that. But he, I was at many experiences where we tried all sorts of crazy things with wine and food because he was always adventurous, like they're always promoting innovation. Uh, but luckily, or maybe unluckily, he had no complete disregard for the business case of anything. So it doesn't matter what it costs mm. as long as we have a go at it. Well, I'm glad that he, you know, instilled um, quality and and in terms of having a good time because that's incredibly important and it's definitely something I've heard about him <laughs> from many a people. But like I said, I want to touch on Zin House because you have an absolutely incredible restaurant out there and it is an absolute must-do on the Mudgee map. I want to share briefly, very briefly, my experience of having lunch out there because it really um, – it really had an effect on me and, and and it kind of came at a time when I was questioning whether or not, you know, um, I wanted to stay in, in a kind of the restaurant scene. So we arrived out um, at Zin House for lunch. I think it was on a Sunday or something like that. And we were met as we drove the car up to the front door by uh, one of your managers standing out the front, you know, bottle in hand, pouring us bubbles at uh, as this beautiful warm welcome as we walked in the door, you know, we've been expecting you. We're so glad to see you. Big warm smiles. And then we took our glasses of bubbles and wandered through your amazing gardens where we kind of, it was so so tactile. There was, you know, some of the workers in there, you know, picking different herbs in their kind of wicker baskets. We went through and looked at all the, the crops, which were just flourishing at the time. And then had lunch in one of your little private dining rooms where you obviously paid us a little visit. We talked a little bit about history of kind of uh, Robert Lowe and and his 11 children and and some of the artifacts that you have placed around the place. We had the most amazing lunch with a nice little moment to take a walk halfway through the meal, you know, while we're kind of just digesting things. And then it was suggested that we have dessert 
and gin and tonics and some beautiful mudgy sweet wine out in the garden to finish. It was truly one of the most beautiful hospitality experiences I've ever had. Um, and it reminded me again about what it really means to um, embrace people, to show them a good time and to show them the best of what a region offers. So thank you for that experience. It really touched me. And um like I said, it is an incredible place. I mean, you guys have just really nailed it out there. Well, that's very kind. We've, we've, we've been going 10 years now, and, and my wife, Kim, is the inspiration. She, she directs the whole operation there, and her standards are that we should grow as much as we can, some things we can't grow. and We want people to know that food is really simple and easy, and uh, if you see the chefs preparing it, you know it's fresh and natural. It makes our job as being organic growers easy because you don't have to preserve it and send it at vast distances. We we find that uh, you know part of the job is educating the chefs as well to be innovative. And, and but there's nothing better packaged than a freshly washed carrot. You don't have to do anything fancy with it. You have to put it on there. And and you need to be able to have a place and a house called the Zen House is about generosity. So we will try and be generous with all the food service. So we we. Um, we're always evolving it. We're, we spend a lot of time with the chefs on growing different things and working it out. We're, we're not all things to all people. It is, it is uh, we try and take time. So we do ask people if they, how long they want. If they're in a real hurry, that's going to be tricky. We ask people to go have a walk around, just not just because we're going to wash the dishes. There's nothing like that at all. It's about that they need time to reflect and see where we do things and, and start, start a conversation. Don't put your phones away and have a conversation. It's it's an experience. It's a special occasion restaurant for most people. We support it well by locals. We now see more and more people make the drive up to do it. So, look, I'm pleased you saw that and did that. We Sometimes Kim and I will wander in and we'll talk to people at the, at the restaurant. Sometimes we don't. People want to be private, so that's uh, that's okay too. So, Kim, Kim loves it, loves the restaurant. She's actually over there now. I'm going back in a minute to have dessert. <laughs> Oh, well, she's done an, a fabulous job and it is true, a, a true gem. It is absolutely worth the drive if you go all the way out to Low Family Wine Co. and just have lunch and that's all you do. It is absolutely worthwhile and, um, yeah, I can't wait till the next time I get out there, I have to say. But I am curious to know a little bit about your palate, David, and I want to know if you could only drink three beverages for the rest of your life, what would they be and why? Ooh, well... Uh, well, I'm, I mean, I am beverages. I, I am. My father used to love um, single malt whiskey, and uh, I spent some time in Scotland, and I got to know a bit about how it. And I would have thought that whiskey would be, would be one of them. I think nothing worse than being cold, and I think whiskey is one of those beverages that can warm me on the inside. It's a. It has a great connection to history. Uh, there's a lot of history and history with it as well, and how they do it. So I find. I think really good whiskey is a great drink. You don't need much of it, and I do like it on the rocks. So it gradually changes. You, the, the bits we learn from distillation means that as the as the alcohol changes, the flavours change. So that's really it can be technical as well as being just really good to taste on a cold day. So that's one of them. Uh, I'd have to say that. The, my f- absolute favourite that, is, that Australia, no one else in the world does, as I understand, is that something that is uniquely Australian is our muskets. And I think uh, this is a wine of about 18 to 20%. There's, obviously, there's the old muskets. Mudgee had a place in history with the muskets, but it didn't carry on like Rutherglen did. So I'd say a, a great old musket reflects all of the things about sunshine in a bottle it's concentrated and it's got a lot of – it's a source of sugar, I suppose. If you had to drink it, there's a good source of sugar there. It, it doesn't have to be stored in a fancy cellar for a long time and any, everybody I know loves a sip of it. Whether you're, whether you're playing the All Blacks and it's 4 nil down at half time, you reach for the musket, it's the only solution, or you want to have something young and fruity, we've developed a young musket uh, this year and last year called Aliatico, and we have that as a 15% and we th- as a spritzer, we can throw some carbon dioxide and that's quite a nice way to do it as well. It's really fragrant. Those terpene smells of, of musket are really enticing and interesting, like Turkish delight, so I love that. So there's a fair bit you can do with musket. And I guess I can't – I couldn't go past, and I don't have any particular favourites, but a red wine from a warm climate, and there's about five varieties that I know – 
have this characteristic of being a warm climate red wine, which is aromatic, soft, and you can taste the sun. And of course, Shiraz is the great doer, but Grenache, Tempranillo, our own Zinfandel, Carignan, and those Mediterranean, Croatian varieties, uh, they just got this beautiful, so even Rioja, those incredible scented, slightly ripe characters, soft flavours, they're really generous and they really make you feel great. You can have just 100 ml in the glass and you can sit and smell it for three hours if you want to do. And, you know, it's one of those easy wines where you it tastes like it smells. You can smell it and you know you're tasting it at the same time. So it's great value. You drink less and you can just enjoy that wine over many, many hours. And that smell never goes away. And it's just like an indelible stamp in my brain about that anywhere you want to have a great time, those sort of red wines of softness, fragrance, and uh, and full-bodied and flavoured without being aggressive uh, are just, just fantastic with any on its own. So that, that would be my three beverages, I guess. I love that. Do you know, I, I mean, that it's like poetry to my ears. You, nobody could say that better, that there's flavours of the sun, and, and I like that. You know, we fell in love with Australian Shiraz for a reason. It is it is a generous wine and it is easy to drink because it's delicious and plump and juicy and like biting into a big blood plum, like just delicious. I love the way you've said that. And they are three excellent drinks and three unique drinks. So you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Loie, it's been such a pleasure having you on. Uh, you are always just such a wealth of knowledge and history and always just a fantastic chat. Thank you so much for making some time today and jumping on the podcast, and I really hope to see you in Mudgee soon. Oh, I love it. Love you. So thank you for reaching out. It's great. It's so, it's so nice to, be, to push the memories and pull the ideas back. Thank you so much for, for asking me and talking to me. I'll see, you, I'll see you around. Sounds good. Cheers to you, David. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Stay tuned for more stories from the world of wine and drinks. Listen in every Thursday on your podcast app. Follow us on Instagram at Over a Glass Pod and contact us at overaglass at deepintheweeds.com.au.